Hello, my name is Donovan McAbee, and I want to welcome you to my backyard in Nashville, Tennessee, for this installment of the Bad Mouth Reading Series. Thanks especially to Rebecca Aronson for inviting me to take part, and I'm excited today to share with you some of my poems, as well as the stories that uh, gave birth to them. So I want to start out, you know, I live in Nashville now, but I grew up in a small town in the upstate of South Carolina uh, in a Southern Baptist church. For those of you who aren't aware of the Southern Baptists in South Carolina, there literally are more Southern Baptists than there are people in South Carolina. Even the Methodists are Baptists, whether they realize it or not. But part of Baptist life, part of evangelical Christian life are these characters called evangelists. And every year, or every year or two in the small church I grew up in, there would be an evangelist who would come through town and often he would deliver these fire and brimstone messages aimed at basically terrifying you into loving God. Now there's a backward logic there, but that sort of was the logic of what was going on. Well, twice in my childhood, there was a, an evangelist who had found a bit of a niche market with the, with the scary sermons. And his message wasn't simply that you're in danger of going to hell, but that you were in danger of going to hell and that rock and roll music was taking you there. So this first poem today comes out of that experience. This first poem is called Crusade Against Rock. The traveling evangelist with the permed mullet played another one bites the dust, slowed down in reverse for our congregation. If we listened closely, he insisted, we could hear Freddie Mercury, who sounded now like Darth Vader, testifying to us all, it's fun to smoke marijuana. It's fun to smoke marijuana. We heard it nearly plain as day. The Lord isn't the only one who works in mysterious ways. The remedy must outdo the poison, the evangelist told us. The next night, I gathered up my own little stack of songs, said goodbye to F you, don't take it personal. Adios, easy does it. So long, straight out of Compton. The liner notes turned black beneath the melting plastic. The fumes of our youth group's burnt offering drifted on the wind. Maybe this was what God wanted. But even now, my heart aches to think about that moment the flames took hold of Bob Marley's legend, his head cocked, his eyes knowing, and all those dreads suddenly on fire. My mama died when I was 25, and uh, less than a year uh, after that, uh, she died of melanoma. Uh, less than a year after that, I started a PhD program at St. Andrews over in Scotland. And it's a little town by the sea, and just along the sea, there's a, there's a little Catholic church that I would go into many afternoons. They just left the doors open for people to go in to pray. And you walk in, and on one side's Jesus, and on one side's Mary at the front. And so sometimes it felt like you go in and you got to choose Jesus, Mary. Jesus, Mary. Do I choose God or God's mama? You know, it's a pretty difficult decision to make. If I, if I choose God, is his mama upset? If I choose his mama, is God upset? You know, as a good Baptist boy, you know, or formerly a good Baptist boy anyway, I would tend to choose Jesus, but occasionally I'd hang out with, with God's mama uh, as well. But uh, the, the, the second half of this poem kind of grows out of that experience and what that meditative place meant for my own spirituality in those days of grief. And the first part, the opening of the poem is inspired uh, by a little bit of Nashville folklore as well. So uh, prepare your hearts and minds for this poem. It's called Sightings. Shortly after her death, Mother Teresa appeared in a cinnamon bun in Nashville, Tennessee. She looked serious, perturbed even, as though this epiphany were an inconvenience. Once in the 90s, when statues of the Virgin were crying all over Ireland. One in Donegal did not get the memo. A sign hung around its neck announcing this Holy Mother out of order. 
I found myself two years after mom died in the second pew from the front in a dark, empty chapel. I looked up at the six foot tall wooden Jesus votive candles at his feet and I could see a tear falling over and over down his right cheek, a trick of light and shadow. But somehow in that moment, I knew they were for me, those tears. Uh, so nearly five years ago, my dad was visiting my wife and I here in Nashville, Tennessee. We sat down at the dinner table and uh, as we, uh, we are still a very religious family, I'm a practicing Christian. I say that I'm practicing because I'm still really terrible at it, like really bad. Um, but uh, we sit down at the table. We're going to say the blessing for the Sunday lunch. I reach uh, across to hold my wife's hand. I reach next to me to, to, to hold my dad's hand and, and he has slumped over the table. And I shake him and shake him. And in my mind, it's just sort of rushing. Is he having a heart attack, a stroke, a seizure? What's going on? And once I could tell he wasn't breathing, I took him to the floor and performed CPR. It's a very long and crazy story. He, he coded five times that day. And uh, miraculously, seemingly, uh, he's still with us today. And, and, and at that time, my wife was pregnant with our first child, and we've now had our second child. So my father's been able to live and see two more grandchildren born. But in the middle of this event, it was unclear whether he was going to live for days. And it was even longer before we knew if he was going to be cognitively intact and Thankfully, he was both, but this next poem grows out of that experience. It's called Breath. All of a sudden, you slumped out of life, those bluest of eyes staring out to where form collapses, unaware in your awareness of the sudden blows back against the floor, the cracking of sternum beneath my hands, attempting to call you back from wherever it was you were wandering off to, forcing air into your lungs, the hum high pitch squeal, the call to clear electricity, lifting you for a moment near resurrection. I hold your hand in the ER as you die again and again and again and again. Epinephrine, norepinephrine, vasopressin, amiodarone, propofol, fentanyl, a dozen more dripping, portacath in your neck, femoral line, IVs snaked into both your arms, swan gans fish hooked through the heart's chambers, the plastic tube in your lungs jitters each breath. I sit beside your bed, hoping God might be bothered enough this time to answer a prayer. After the fact, I know you by the space you leave empty. I draw lines in the air where the roof used to be. I wait for you, Lord, like a mailbox for a letter. The grass still wonders how the ground got there. So before I did that um, PhD over in Scotland, I'd gone to seminary and uh, was a minister at a church, youth minister, which is uh, people that people that minister with young people deserve like, I don't know, nicer cars or a better spot in heaven. I don't know. Uh, but it was, it was a rich time in my life. But I had gone to seminary before. I've been a minister. And even today, I'm a uh, professor of religion and the arts at a university here in Nashville. And I'm part-time on staff at a church here in town. And, you know, a lot of people like to get into the conversation, is there a God or is there not a God? As though the divine or the sacred or the mystery at the heart of creation is 
something that we can talk about like we talk about every other thing. So I usually don't engage in those conversations, but these next two poems are my attempt to enter the fray and to the question of whether or not there is in fact a God. I don't know. See if you're convinced by either of these poems. I try to approach it from two different angles. The first poem is called Anecdotal Evidence for the Existence of God. Orgasms. I'm just going to sit with that one for a moment. I usually like that first line. Cotton candy. Chocolate covered almonds. Coffee. River stones. That time after praying when I would have doubted my own existence before I would have doubted God's. Tortoises. Ice cream. The ocean. And now, a poem from the opposing viewpoint. Anecdotal evidence against the existence of God. The poor design and frequent malfunctioning of the prostate gland. Licorice. World War II. Dysentery. The Godfather. Part Three. All those times after praying when I went away empty. Mosquitoes. Standardized tests. Every square inch of Orlando, Florida. My wife doesn't like that line. Not at all. She has, in fact, informed me that we will at some point in the not so distant future be taking our chi children to Orlando, Florida and perhaps Disney World. Um, it's a thought that terrifies me. It keeps me up at night and yet I know I should resign myself to that fate. I look in the mirror sometimes and I think, how did I get to looking so old? How did the topography of my face begin to have such rough terrain? And this poem is in many ways an attempt to think about and wrestle with the notion of the body and of aging. It's called Holy the Body. I've thought so little of you that now you seek your revenge in the grinding of kneecaps, the tightening of hamstrings, loss of elasticity, the skin, so long neglected, you weren't even an afterthought. I apologize each morning with a handful of pills. Oh, scarred flesh of me in the mirror. As I turn the page on another decade, I bless the stretch marks on my stomach, evidence of those dead years when food was my one friend. I bless the crow's feet at the corners of my eyes, proof of days spent under the sun. I bless the gray in my beard, reminder that sometimes, despite ourselves, wisdom appears. I bless our breaking down, dear body. Pray the process is slow, that when time confronts us with its choices, you'll teach me when to hold on, when to let go. visitation. And then there's the time I was walking down the sidewalk and the sky burst open, clouds peeled back, and I saw three angels like Cirque du Soleil acrobats ascending and descending on silk ropes hung from the heavens. The angels the size of 747s. One's face resembled blind justice. Another's the Statue of Liberty and the third's Sinead O'Connor with clown makeup. I was stopped in my tracks, dumbfounded, discovered I was holding an ice cream cone that had not been in my hand before the vision began, three scoops high, though I couldn't eat it, stunned as I was with wonder at the display in the heavens when suddenly they stopped. The angels hovered and pointed to me. They must have been 5,000 feet away or 1,500 meters if you measure these things metrically. But I could see them clearly, 
their faces statuesque, their eyes squinting, ancient. Then a voice spoke. It was the clown face Sinead O'Connor, but she had an English accent, as all angels surely must. And she said to me, take the ice cream, eat. And the words that come to you, write them on a foggy mirror in the bathroom after you shower. Etch them in sand just before the tide comes in. Scratch them with a nail into a table at the McDonald's at exit 398. Then change your life accordingly. We are the messengers of your making. And now sit back and enjoy the rest of the show. And you should have seen what they did next. I was caught up in their ecstasy, ice cream in hand, dancing angels in the distance and above their heads, nothing but sky. So we've come to the last poem I'm gonna share with you today. Uh, one of the things that poets love to do is to not simply be pretentious, but to be pretentious poetically. And one of the ways poets do that is to give their poems uh, foreign language titles and especially dead languages. Like those are the best. That's when you know someone's being particularly pretentious. Uh, I'm mostly kidding. I hope. Uh, but this poem, the final one I want to share with you today is called Corpus. When God is silent late at night and I'm watching the shadows the moon makes against the walls, I wish sometimes for certainty to know God like the fetal pig I dissected in high school. Its legs tied back with twine on an aluminum tray, flesh obedient to the scalpel as I separated skin from meat, meat from bone, living silence from the silence of death. But I lie awake and listen instead to the wind rustled leaves of the poplar, to the quiet breaths my wife makes as she lies here sleeping. And I pray or think to myself, which in these moments feels like prayer. Oh, this is enough. This is more than enough. Thank you so much for joining me today, giving me the opportunity to share some of my poems with you. I hope that you continue to tune in to the Bad Mouth Reading Series and hope you have a great day. Thanks so much. Bye-bye.